we will get started. So I want to welcome everybody to Mass Mountain Regional Library's annual diary program series on local history. Programs on local history and culture presented by local authorities in their fields. This fall, we focus in, on topics in preservation and conservation in the Valley. The Dyerly Program Series on Local History honors Dr. Henry Price Dyerly, a local physician, and his wife, Mary, who was a nurse. As early collectors of antiques and artifacts produced in the Shenandoah Valley, the Dyerlys were instrumental in raising awareness of and research into the Valley's rich cultural history. In honor of their parents, the Dyerly children have supported Massanut Regional Li Library for almost 20 years, and it is because of them that this lecture, lecture series is made possible. Tonight, our program is Conserving and Protecting the River, Your Role and Ours, and I will introduce our speaker in just a minute. But I did want to remind everybody that there are still two more upcoming programs in the Diary series. Next Thursday, October 21st, again at 7 p.m., our program is Preserving with Pots, the Importance of Collections and Archives with Dr. Scott Souter, Professor of English at Bridgewater College. Scott will explore the importance of preserving artifacts and collections and discuss his new book, A Potter's Progress, Progress, Emmanuel Souter and the Business of Craft. Our final program on October 28th is Voices in the Silence, Locating and Preserving Burial Grounds with Dr. R. Shane McGarry, Assistant Professor of Geophysics at James Madison University. Shane will explain his research and use of ground penetrating radar to identify the location of unmarked antebellum African-American cemeteries. Again, all of these programs will be presented live via Zoom. You can pre-register by visiting mrlib.org and going to our events calendar. Tonight's session will be recorded and available on our MRL YouTube channel as well. So just a few housekeeping Zoom tips. This is a webinar format, so attendees will remain muted. But as you think of questions during the program, please type them into the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen, and I will share them during the Q&A portion of the program. And now let me introduce tonight's speaker. Mary Emma Dryack is an earth scientist, science communicator, and an advocate for action on creating solutions to the global climate crisis. Her interest in the environment was honed whilst growing up on a small family farm in Wisconsin and was further developed while studying physical geography at Durham University in Northeast England. Mary Emma received her master's from the University of Maine in 2019 in earth and climate science, during which she studied glacier and changing climates. Since that time, she has worked in outdoor and environmental education, which took her from Alaska to New Mexico to Panama to the banks of the Mississippi River, and finally landed her in Virginia to work as program coordinator with the Friends of the North Fork of the Shenandoah River. Mariama is ecstatic to work with and listen to the community within the North Fork watershed to develop engaging, place-based educational programming and a more active engagement in science through long-term monitoring programs and citizen science. So now I'm going to turn the program over to Mariama. Thank you for that wonderful introduction and hello. I hope everyone is having a good evening. Um, as mentioned, we're going to be talking about the very broad topic of conserving and protecting the river and not just what you can do, but also what Friends of the North Fork of the Shenandoah River and other river conservation organizations do to help make that happen. Um, and before we really launch into that, I want to give a bit of a background on Friends of the North Fork of the Shenandoah River. So as a program coordinator, I work with education and science programming primarily, and that helps meet our mission, which is to keep the North Fork of the Shenandoah clean, healthy, and beautiful through advocacy, community action, education, and science. Um, and so all of our programming really is focused on those things and um, is exactly the reason why I'm able to give a talk today. And we'll, I'll be diving more into specifically what this means later on in, in the talk, but I uh, wanted to give a bit of an introduction there. And then wanted to open up the talk by asking what does it mean to conserve and protect the river? Um, the river, again, being broad. I know um, some of you may be from Harrisonburg. We might be in different locations. I'm going to speak to the North Fork of the Shenandoah and also um, some of the rivers that literally water Harrisonburg. Um, 
And, and so it will be purposely vague, but there will be examples dotted throughout. And I think a, a really crucial question to all of this, anytime I give a talk, I ask why should people listening care about the river um, or the environment more broadly? And so we're going to launch straight into that latter question so that you have investment as I continue. Um, I'm going to start with basic information, but I think sometimes um, we take this information to granted when we work in river conservation, and that is that everyone drinks water from surface or ground water sources. And um, for surface water in Virginia, I will note that this is taken from the Virginia Natural Resources Education Guide um, in the 1990s, but the numbers are roughly accurate for what holds today. Um, our surface water resources are rivers, lakes, springs, and wetlands. And all of those are connected in some way, shape, or form. But what we'll be focusing on today are streams and rivers as they are relevant to where we're getting our water from in the Shenandoah Valley broadly. Um, so you can see a breakdown of how we rely on water there. And uh, I think a good broad definition is that surface water is anything we can see. And then there are a large portion of folks who rely on groundwater for their drinking water. Um, that's water found beneath the soil mantle and um, large units of water in the ground are called aquifers. And we'll be touching just a little bit on aquifers later, but we'll be focusing mostly on surface water today. As that's most relevant to anyone living in Harrisonburg at the moment, um, and along with multiple towns throughout the valley. Uh, there are or cities and towns throughout the valley. There are some folks, some locations that still rely on wells for drinking water, but for the most part, um, the larger cities in the valley, some of which include Strasburg, Woodstock, uh, Winchester, rely on the North Fork of the Shenandoah River for their water. And we're going to be diving in promptly. Uh, we'll be diving promptly into where does Harrisonburg get its water? Um, so they extract, anyone in Harrisonburg relies on water extracted from surface water sources. And approximately 50% of that water comes from the Dry River, most, more specifically the Switzer Reservoir in Raleigh Springs. And the city of this, all this information is available on the city of Harrisonburg website. Um, and they also communicate there that 50% of that water comes from the North River in the Bridgewater area. And they're also, both of those rivers notably feed into the South Fork of the Shenandoah River and then the Shenandoah River more broadly. And so those water resources are in the Shenandoah River watershed. And the city of Harrisonburg is currently working on plans to build a supply line pulling directly from the South Fork of the Shenandoah as well. So uh, before we launch into specifics related to water, another uh, big motivation for why we should care about um, you know, keeping our water resources clean and river conservation and preservation is that we are all connected to one another through our watersheds. A watershed is defined as the land over which water runs to then collect in a water body, um, most often at a lower, a lowest elevation um, within that topography. And watersheds are separated by divides or topographic highs. So what we're looking at here, um, on the right is a map of the Shenandoah watershed, the Shenandoah River watershed, denoted by this red line. And um, what we're seeing is that watershed being divided by uh, the Blue Ridge Mountains and um, confined by the Allegheny Mountains. And you'll see then also looking at this watershed map that Harrisonburg is connected to other locations throughout the valley, say to Winchester, um, through all being in the same watershed. Um, topographically, it's unique in that, or, or our, our valley is unique 
in some ways in that water from Harrisonburg ends up going to the South Fork and notably Massanutten Mountain is in between the South Fork and the North Fork of the Shenandoah River, but they converge around Front Royal. Why is this important? Everyone has a watershed address. So that's very similar to our street addresses in that when we think of a street address, we have a number for a location. We have a um, street, a town, a county, city, or sorry, county, state, <laughs> that'd be going backwards, state, country, and then ultimately we're all connected within the world. Similarly, we all have a watershed address. So when we think of this, we're thinking of that smallest body of water most proximal to us, and then the next larger body of water that that tributary feeds into, a larger river, a larger river, and ultimately in, in our location, we are linked to the Chesapeake Bay and then the Atlantic Ocean. So I have an example here um, with us pretending that we are living in the Arboretum in Harrisonburg. So for someone living in an arboretum in Harrisonburg, we are connected to most proximately Black's Run. And the way I paint this for kids, but it's just as relevant to us here, is that if I were to throw a piece of trash in the arboretum or spill oil in the arboretum or my car has an oil leak, I ask, do you think that matters to someone living in Front Royal? or someone living in Washington, DC, because that seems super far away. And most often the answer is no, but we are so, so very much linked because our water bodies are connecting bodies. And what we do in one place affects people downstream. So here, that piece of trash would go to Black's Run or could go to Black's Run, the North River, then be diverted into South Fork of the Shenandoah, the Shenandoah River, Potomac River in Harper's Ferry, it links then to the Chesapeake Bay. And theoretically there, the president could wave at that piece of trash, see the impact from upstream, and then go to the Atlantic Ocean. Obviously, this is a mildly exaggerated example because trash breaks down often. Um, but our sediments certainly from the valley end up in the Chesapeake Bay. And you can see that from magnificent um, and really striking aerial imagery, which I recommend checking out or take a field trip to Harper's Ferry sometime and look at the difference in color um, of the Shenandoah River and the Potomac River as they converge because the Shenandoah River is very sediment laden. And we're gonna be going into why that matters a little bit later on. So we're all linked. What is conservation though? Um, this is the act of protecting natural resources for current and future generations. And the difference between conservation and preservation is that preservation has this more, um, th this more direct link in protecting the environment from harmful effects of human activity. And so we're considering broadly how we can lessen our impact on our natural resources, um, for ourselves today. And then, um, for those in the future, and especially under changing climate and variability in climate, this is important um, for creating um, some semblance of climate resiliency and dependability of what will be there in the future. Okay, so the premise I'm gonna start out with on this slide, which is discussing types of river conservation, is that there are boundless um, different techniques associated with river conservation. And I'm only going to scratch the surface here, but I'm going to touch on some, some um, commonly discussed methods of river conservation. And there's definitely gonna be overlap in from one bullet point to, to another. So starting broadly um, with habitat and river restoration, this is the idea that we could work through different means and methods to get a river back to um, some sort of natural state where there's equil equilibrium um, between, say, a water resource and its surrounding ecosystems uh, so that there, that balance then can facilitate a healthy habitat ecosystems and therefore a healthy river um, upon which humans all throughout the valley, all throughout the world rely. 
Another big topic of discussion in river conservation, um, and there, if you do a quick Google search on the web, you can find many different examples throughout the, the country, if you're interested specifically in the United States of dam removal. So dams were really useful and we see evidence of dams all throughout the valley and um, the Northeast and the country for uh, you know hydroelectric electricity, hydropower in the past, um, they were really useful to mills. And yet when we put in even these, these small scale dams all throughout uh, the country, we changed a habitat that other, or, or an, uh, a system that was otherwise in some semblance of equilibrium. And um, we transformed riverbanks, we transformed habitats for the things living in and around it. And the effects of human uh, activity as it relates to dams and as we'll learn deforestation and such are still being felt today and are especially relevant again with changing climate. So, I think something that, that Friends of the North Fork of the Shenandoah River talks a lot about and something that is really attainable to contribute towards as a person living day to day and wanting to you know, leave a better impact on the environment is considering how we can keep water resources clean. Uh, this can look many ways and we're going to be diving into pollutants later on, but um, and notably sediments and nutrients are a big uh, pollution aspect that comes from the valley along with urban runoff. Um, urban runoff, I think, is something that is sometimes forgotten. But when anytime you have an impermeable surface where the water cannot seep through the ground, that can lead to runoff of any and all sort of urban pollutants, including oil from cars and um, other pollutants associated with large density of people that can then be channeled into our water bodies. Uh, trash pickup is another easy way to help keep our water resources clean. But of course, this is also scaled to industry. And again, we'll, we'll touch on this later on. Something we also will be learning more about are riparian buffer tree plantings. Just to define riparians right off the bat, that's land proximal to a water body, um, specifically a river. And a buffer is that land in between one land use type and then the river. We also can be supporting and protecting diverse flora and fauna, and that's certainly linked to the first bullet point I mentioned in, around habitat and river restoration, because if we are thinking about what diverse fauna and flora thrive in, it is often those environments um, it, it, that have been less impacted by humans. Um, Additionally, conservation through science-driven education and advocacy is a big one. I think this is something sometimes we don't think about um, because it is removed from the physical environment of the outdoors, but certainly policies that are um, voted on and moved forward in um, you know, state and federal agencies or governments are relevant to what funds are available to be able to carry out on the ground river conservation and education around why all of this matters is critical. Uh, something that we won't have the opportunity to watch a video on today, but I will summarize uh, when we get there, is that legacy sediment is this, uh, these big bands of sediment associated with a active time period of deforestation um, when the East was being largely developed. That and along with dams and, and standing water um, for different types of industry led to a big change in what our riverbanks looked like. And therefore um, that thickness of riverbank and sediment deposition has also changed uh, how the river and flooding in the river impacts folks living around it when we have big flood events because there's much more sediment that can be moved. And um, I'll touch on that a little bit, but mainly channel you towards a YouTube video 
uh, and a lecture that a volunteer of ours gave earlier in the spring to that goes into much farther depth than we'll have time to get to today. And as I mentioned, so very much more, uh, this is just scratching the surface. But I think a good starting place. So um, I've decided to cut this, but you have a little blurry screen of a New River Land Trust video put together. The New River Land Trust is located around Roanoke in Virginia, and they uh, discussed stream conservation as it relates to how different government agencies and funding can help private landowners transform what their riparian buffers and look like. And that could look like a couple of things, including um, tree plantings along the river where there previously were none that looks like ex excluding cattle from streams um, where they were previously able to drink out of the river. But when you have cattle in streams, you also have excrement from cattle in streams and therefore are rivers, which can lead to problems downstream and, you know, an increase in, in nutrient loading for a river. And so funding from state agencies um, can and some other uh, private funding resources, there, there's lots of funding out there for this sort of thing, can help us um, pay for or can help private landowners. And specifically uh, something I'm familiar with is farmers in the Valley pay for, let's say a land or a water resource, a well that is separate to um, where they, the stream. And so, uh, this just allow reduces the barrier of entry to farmers to be able to do that and to be able to exclude cattle from streams where it previously existed. Um, and that has knock on effects for the habitat. So this video, which I recommend watching and um, I believe will be put in the chat or already has been, this goes into why uh, exclusion of cattle from streams has, and riparian buffer installation has been really beneficial to the habitat for some fish that are um, really cared about in this area. So give that a watch. And then this is a video put together by Science uh, summarizing some research that was done previously related to legacy sediment. So again, legacy sediment is sediment that came um, due to erosion associated with massive deforestation uh, during logging days when that was a huge, huge, huge part of what was coming from the valley. Um, and so if anyone's anyone who's floated on the North Fork certainly has seen in areas these really, really, really tall um, river banks. And if you look closely, you'll see, uh, different bands of colors of sediment. And those different bands refer to different periods in time associated with large erosion events. And that sediment then is easily erodible when we have a lot of rain. And this isn't uh, unique to the North Fork at all. It's all over the, the Eastern United States and I'm sure on um, rivers all throughout Virginia. But if you're interested in learning more about how projects uh, specifically discussed in this video by science uh, have redirected the course of rivers to try to restore it back to what it previously looked like before logging. Uh, definitely check out this video and check out a uh, lecture that is on the Friends of the North Fork of the Shenandoah River YouTube channel about legacy sediment and um, how that might be linked to um, anticipating future changes by a volunteer of ours. Um, and you can find that on the Friends of the North Fork website. So I wanted to give you a taste of different projects that Friends of the North Fork isn't currently working on, um, the latter of which is pretty large scale and requires a lot of money and, and investment from local community members. But uh, now I want to dive into why should we, or what we should think about um, polluting our water. Specifically, um, there are these main pollutants that are pretty commonly found. And um, 
I'm going to link that to a bit of history as well. So sediments, this is one that's overlooked often because um, it's not a logical, oh, that is dirty sort of thing, but uh, sediments certainly pollute water and they, uh, they mess with the ecosystems as they exist for the life within the water. They reduce oxygen in some circumstances and they therefore certainly impact and pollute our water resources, make it more difficult to clean, which uh, directly dictates how much we're paying for our water as well if we're taking it from the river. And as I said, Harrisonburg relies on river related resources as does much of the valley. So urban and suburban stormwater flows, again, if you have impermeable water resources, or sorry, impermeable surfaces, water is not able to penetrate and ends up being channeled more quickly into water. Bodies, phosphates and nitrates from agricultural sources. This is another thing also associated with um, maybe not having as, as good of uh, land use practices in place. And we'll talk a little bit about best management practices and how to prevent that. Improperly treated sewage, which comes sometimes from storms or failed septic systems. Industrial waste. Um, if you think about industrial scale facilities and factories and the waste that comes from that, that's something we, we can really easily point to and think, oh, that's not something we want in our water. Um, but this is also relevant to us putting oil directly down our drain. Um, because if you think about that when scaled to everyone doing that, that makes an impact. And there are some campaigns um, with many river conservation organizations focused on trying to show people how they can properly dispose of those things. Acids and leachates from abandoned mines and dumps, encroaching salt water, especially relevant to our Eastern coast in Virginia. Um, and this is especially relevant with new development happening anytime you're in a coastal area, because as we learned earlier, groundwater often is present in aquifers, these large units, and so multiple wells can be tapped into the same aquifer. And if one person dr drills a well in such a way that um, it penetrates salt water, that entire aquifer is affected. It's not just that one well. And herbicides and pesticides, another logical thing we don't want in our water. And this can, can come from the water and sediments running off land, especially if you don't have any barrier in between your field and the water. But for a historical context on water in the valley, we're going to look at these two. So phosphates and nitrates entering our water from agricultural resources and improperly treated sewage. So we're gonna go on a journey to Woodstock, Virginia in the 1800s and learn about what, what life looked like at that time. So at that time, Woodstock's water came from wells that were polluted by animal and human waste for many reasons. Um, up until the 1870s, pigs were allowed to roam freely on the streets. And with that means that excrement was able to be um, you know, left anywhere by those critters. And Woodstock also relied, did not have indoor plumbing at that time. And I'm talking about Woodstock here, but this is um, easily extrapolatable to many locations throughout the valley. Timing was a little bit different in, um, you know, different locations, obviously, but this is our case study here. So we had um, then issues associated with storms, as mentioned earlier, um, you know, washing excrement from animals and then overflowing perhaps already stressed outhouses and sewage related to that and down the streets and into the water resources, which were um, in Woodstock, they had eight public wells owned by the town and throughout the and, and in use throughout the town up until 1900. I had the privilege of being able to go to the Shenandoah County Library and look through the archives there and read all about 
um, what people thought about pigs roaming freely or, you know, the state of water in Woodstock in this time period by looking through the Shenandoah Herald. And um, one direct quote from that research is that in 1886, the Herald records history of bad stenches associated with swill barrels, hog pens, closets, and cow yards. Um, it was in 1878 that hogs were no longer allowed to roam freely in the streets. And also, if you're more interested in specifics associated with this, you can check out the Shenandoah County Library archives as well, or you can look at a talk that I gave earlier in the year on the history of water in Woodstock, where I go into more depth about, you know, specific locations, perhaps of wells and what disgruntled citizens thought about it. Because if you have a lot of stress on those wells and you have pollutants going in there, you also have this fear of sicknesses sweeping the country. Um, people were getting scared about health um, as they were reading about what was happening in locations elsewhere. And so folks you know, spoke up and installing waterworks in Woodstock was controversial. There, if, if, if you want a bit of evening entertainment, definitely look back through those Woodstock or those um, Shenandoah Herald articles because there's a really sometimes amusing back and forth between people for and against waterworks. And the main opponents of the waterworks were to be that folks didn't want their taxes raised. Um, but there are also some really good cases breaking down the math of like how much taxes would be raised by and, and making a case for it being totally worth investing in the future in that way. And in July 1888, the mayor was authorized by town council to call a meeting for citizens to discuss their water system possibilities. Note this, that this was 1888. This is 10 years after pigs are no longer able to roam the streets. And it took almost 10 years for citizens to really, really, really amp up their distress against not having better water resources um, through, you know, these public resources of the Shenandoah Herald. But of course, that's just one snapshot in time. I'm sure the discourse was much, um, much broader than that. And then uh, then in the 19, in spring of 1900, town council decided to construct a reservoir on Mass Mountain Mountain on the east side of town. And um, one, I guess, slightly sassy response to not having good sanitation set up there um, was a you know letter to the editor of the Herald saying something to the effect of, I hope that uh, this town, the town council members decide to take a walk down the, this specific street near this specific well um, to get a taste on a, of what, you know, the state of sanitation in Woodstock is like on a hot summer's day because it smells awful and we know that people are getting sick from this water. So wonderful. Ultimately, sanitation won the debate and in um, October, on October 19th, 1901, an engineer completed the dam on the east side of the town on Massanutten Mountain. And here is a picture of one of the, the very first reservoir that was constructed. This can be found in Seven Bend State Park. If you haven't been there, it's a state park just outside of Woodstock. It's absolutely stunning. And it has some of these really awesome historical um, resources where you can learn more about, about history there. Um, this is the first well, or sorry, first reservoir. And there was a later, there were later two more reservoirs constructed to keep pace with demand for water. Um, and you can learn more about the history of water in Woodstock again on the Friends of the North Fork YouTube channel where I gave a presentation more specifically on that. Okay. So I'm gonna bring us back to pollutants and, and, and just bring attention to the fact that today with you know, uh, more, you know, past industrialization, not past, we're still industrializing. Um, 
we have to worry about all of these things as it affects our water resources, especially because we know a lot of us are reliant on these surface water resources. And if you get your water from a well, in some way, shape or form, you are dependent on surface water, especially because our food system is so complex. So what can each of us do to protect and conserve the river? I think first and foremostly, a, a, an easy thing to take stock of is how evaluating how you contribute to water contamination in your watershed. Each and every one of us has an impact. And if we do basic things like maintaining our vehicles or our farm equipment, um, we can not only keep that up and keep those things in good conditions, you know, which is the good for the lifetime of those things, but we can also prevent things like oil and other substances from um, leaking from them and entering our water. Definitely learn more about your watershed. You can learn more about this uh, through reaching out to local friends organizations wherever you are. There are there's a plethora of resources out there from multiple state agencies, local agencies, nonprofits. And just some I want to reference here include obviously Friends of the North Fork of the Shenandoah River. We can at the very least point you in the right direction if, if you're not within our watershed. Friends of the Shenandoah River we're all related to because we're in that watershed. Friends of Middle River, Friends of Rappahannock River, and others. There are loads of Friends organizations out there. There are also soil and water conservation districts that do a lot to talk about best management practices for land and um, are another great resource to reach out to if you're unsure of where to start and there isn't a friends agency near you um, to point you towards someone who might be able to help uh, you understand more about your watershed and how, how you impact it. Get involved with local river conservation organizations. I've listed a few and again can point you towards more locations. The Chesapeake Bay, Bay Foundation also has awesome resources out there for learning more about how we're all linked within the Chesapeake Bay watershed. And uh, more broadly, has loads of resources on environmental education. Volunteer with those organizations. Many of them are volunteer driven in terms of what they can accomplish. We certainly are. And implement best management practices on your property. Even if you don't land, own land along the river, again, we're linked through watershed and how you're maintaining that property vegetation is definitely relevant. And if you do own land near a river or stream, explore conservation easement options. Uh, and you can find more about different ways in which you can make sure you're, you're managing land in an appropriate way on the Alliance for the Shenandoah Valley's website. And stay educated about the status of water availability and conditions in your area. I state this um, with emphasis because this past summer, certainly the North Fork uh, was experiencing effects of drought and um, lack of water during some parts of the summer. And that led to low water levels, standing water, and then we had harmful algae blooms prop up for 52.5 miles of the North Fork um, to be classified as a harmful algae bloom by the Virginia Department of Health. You have to test positive. The algal mats have to test positive for cyanobacteria which is harmful and can be deadly to pets and humans. And so making sure you know what, what the status of water is um, before you recreate in it, before you let your pets frolic in it is important. And certainly um, from a drought perspective or a, a water stress perspective, if we have less water available, you know, that affects water prices, but also, um, is something to keep an eye on as we continue to experience variability in climate extremes, weather extremes. And write your representatives about advocating for policies um, linked to a clean and healthy environment and watershed. This uh, can't be stressed enough because a lot of decisions are made on that level, but yet certainly we can do a lot locally as human bodies too, not in government. Okay, I'm gonna bring us back now um, to 
what Friends of the North Fork of the Shenandoah River does and what we're about uh, as it relates to our mission statement. So I'm going to start with education because that's kind of the bread and butter of, of what I do and have been focusing on for the past year. Um, we put on these wonderful summer camps, uh, spring and autumn lecture series. I'm going to be going into some of, of these more, in more depth as we go along. So definitely keep, a, keep an eye out for lectures. I'll be discussing some autumn lectures that are coming up as it relates to what I mentioned about um, river health and algae blooms. We also put on workshops and we have some upcoming workshops you can check out on our website. This past summer was awesome. We put on this event series called Voices of the Shenandoah in Story and Song. And we learned about the river at different local breweries, one of which was at Pale Fire in Harrisonburg um, and others dotted throughout the valley where we learned about the river. We did pub quiz style activities and we heard different stories from folks all throughout the valley uh, associated with the river and their connection to it. And we heard from awesome musicians. So who doesn't like a brew and music and stories? Um, definitely something to keep an eye on in the future. We also do school and community group outreach. This is a lot of what I do as it relates to stream health and helping folks understand how we can be keeping an eye on that individually. And I do a lot of watershed education. So this is education, not just relevant to kids, but community groups. And if anyone is interested in having our organization, myself or one of my colleagues speak with your group, um, definitely don't hesitate to reach out. And we also do educational video outreach and especially focused on this um, as remote learning is and has been relevant throughout COVID and put together online resources and online modules for folks to access and for teachers to use. Here are some wonderful photos from our summer camps. So when we say summer camps, we are really focusing on place-based outdoors education, hands-on education, and trying to make the link bet uh, really bet between river conservation and, and preservation and health to the kids who come to our camp. So we run two camps. One is for kids, this may be changing, but this year it was for kids five to eight years old and one for kids nine to 12 years old. And they not only get to play and frolic in the river, but learn about all of the different components of the environment and how they're all linked and how systems are linked. Um, we got to play in Seven Bend State Park and learn about the importance of considering a systems-based approach to learning about the environment in um, definitely got to go out and frolic in general on the, on the water, which is always a good time. So keep an eye out on that for years to come. And something I think especially relevant to folks in attendance today is keeping an eye out for our lecture series. So we are about to launch into our fall lecture series. And this was inspired because of the harmful algae blooms that we, the North Fork experienced this year. And so we thought, why not have a health of the river series to just cover multiple different topics relevant to different groups of people, some of which are relevant to everybody. We have the Virginia Department of Health representative chatting to us. We also have someone from the Virginia Department of Environmental Quality talking about nuisance algae issues more specifically, but also if you're really interested in fishing and knowing what the status of fish uh, in the North Fork is, um, check out our upcoming lecture where we're hearing from another state agency about their research as it relates to that and recreation. And then we do a lot of community outreach events and um, hands-on education, let's say at community days, or, you know, I work with a lot of schools to get kids in rivers to look at all of the life that lives within them. And I'll be talking a little bit more about this um, as it relates to our volunteering opportunities shortly. 
We also work with advocacy. So we have a um, sister slash sub organization called Friends of Seven Bend State Park. And it focuses specific on specifically on park advocacy. And that's something open and available to anybody interested in advocating more for park specific resources. Shenandoah County Water Resources Advisory Committee is something that we sit on in terms of um, informing the decisions they make. And we also have links with regional legislatures and folks in politics to make sure that the river isn't being missed as something crucial to everyone's health and well-being. Um, we've helped with scenic river status and the master plan for the North Fork and the development of that as that plan is proceeding shortly. Next, community action, as I mentioned previously, is a really big part of what we do. So we're a volunteer-based organization, and we have ongoing opportunities for volunteering going on at Seven Bend State Park. Um, some examples of this I just put in there relate to invasive removal, trail maintenance, and multiple other things. They're doing, so this is a, a state park that was opened in 2020 and they've done a marvelous job of development so far, but they have so many uh, dreams for the park to come. And so there's always something to do there. We also have riparian buffer plantings and installation, which I'll be talking about shortly. A benthic macro invertebrate monitoring team. What does that mean? We'll learn about shortly, that shortly. And uh, North Fork Conservation Corps, again, which I'll be diving into. But of course, we also have opportunities, ongoing opportunities, to be picking up trash um, throughout the watershed. And um, also are always looking for learning more about where folks are seeing trash. So even if someone doesn't want to clean it up, we then at least know where we might need to get hands to do that. And um, we're always looking for volunteers to help with education outreach. Okay, so let's learn about the North Fork Conservation Corps. This was an awesome uh, effort that was born again in 2020 that provided local teams with um, mentored, project-centered, and skill-building skill experiences. And that's because in the Shenandoah, um, in Shenandoah County, folks weren't in school on Fridays. And so we you know, this program was born out of trying to think about how to get kids outside, working on projects to help make Seven Bend State Park better, but also, and more accessible to folks, um, but also trying to think about how we could educate. Um, so here are a couple of photos. One on the left, that's a photo of the folks who were in the first group of the NFCC, they are actually cleaning out the reservoirs in Seven Bend State Park for um, visitor access. They built trails to the reservoirs. They also put up um, gates around them or, you know, nice looking fences around them. And then on the right, they're building handicap accessible fishing pads. So um, it's been a really, really neat program that continues to bloom. Uh, a relevant opportunity for volunteering to everyone here is our riparian buffer support team. So forested buffers, as we learned a bit earlier, are help with water filtration before any sediment or nutrients meet the river when they're running off a land body. So it helps and is important to water quality, bank stabilization, and habitat for river life. And ways that we can help um, riparian buffers with permission um, that are already installed are through weeding, vole nest removal, stake tube maintenance, but also we always need hands for installing the buffers at new landowners' properties as well. So if you're interested in that, you can learn more about that on our website or link up with our volunteer coordinator, Julia Sargent, um, who you can again find details for on our website. All right, so benthic macroinvertebrates are these awesome organisms that live on or near the bottom of a stream and they don't have a backbone, can be seen with the naked eye. So that's what those words mean. 
And they tell us wonderful things about water quality. So there are some really pollution intolerant species of benthic macroinvertebrates, and there are some um, that you know can live wherever. And so depending on what we're finding in water bodies, we can assess stream health. If you're interested in learning more about this or becoming a part of our stream health monitoring team, you can, if you have a smartphone or a camera near you, you can take a picture of this QR code and learn more about how to sign up for a training today. Um, we have a training that is going to be launched um, shortly and the test for it is at the start of November. So you can get, get going with it straight away. On the right, we're looking at uh, a map of where we have testing sites already set up and this is not all inclusive, but we're certainly looking for more folks to do this throughout the Valley. And this is a picture on the right of myself actually uh, showing kids how to collect samples of benthic macroinvertebrates with my colleague. And it's as simple as rubbing organisms off of rocks and collecting them in a net. And it's a cool way to get outside. Um, so we work with Virginia Save Our Streams to certify these monitors throughout the valley. And again, you can be trained as a monitor. So uh, check that opportunity out, certainly. And so this benthic macroinvertebrate opportunity is one of the ways we're actively involved in science in the valley. Um, and, and, you know, collecting data to know what our water bodies look like. And we also do stream chemistry monitoring in partnership with uh, Friends of the Shenandoah River. Um, and we work with Karen Anderson, who runs those chemistry examples to know more specifically what the makeup of the water is looking like. Um, and she works out of Shenandoah University for that. And so we have a lot of breadth to what we do and a lot of opportunities to get involved. And so if any of this tickles your fancy, is intriguing to you, um, certainly check out our website. Our website is fnfsr.org, stands for Friends of the North Fork of the Shenandoah River. And I wanted to leave you with two things. Um, one, this is a list of our upcoming uh, educational opportunities on the docket, volunteering opportunities on the docket. We have that autumn lecture series, as I mentioned previously, and these are the agencies we're going to be hearing from. We also have a Build a Rain Barrel workshop, two of those coming up in November, and a benthic macroinvertebrate monitoring training. So I will pop back to that, but I think I really wanted to leave everyone with the question of, I, you know, I've just offloaded all of this information to you about how you can get involved in conserving and protecting the river. And I want to know, or have you consider what role you might be able to play in conserving and protecting the river. So thank you so much for having me. Um, and I've really enjoyed speaking with you all today and I'm happy to take any questions. All right, thank you. That was I love the um, the snippets you pulled from the newspaper. Um, <laughs> that yes, and uh, the the sassy response of uh, <laughs> having your your local pol politicians walk down the street in high summer in uh, the pig areas where they were not cleaning up. So okay, because that's obviously what fascinated me uh, at one point during the lecture. So there were just articles in the local paper all about the the debate going back and forth between the local yes and was it really was it really local people or did, were there like outside voices as well in it, any of it appeared to be local folks mm -hmm. for the most part um and i mean in general reading the shenandoah herald in the 1900s is really entertaining because journalism styles have certainly changed but there was a lot of back and forth advocating for it um, in the context of, of the local scene and politics. Um, but there were also random entries of folks saying, hmm, I think we should get the waterworks because I had a dream about a beautiful woman. And, the, <laughs> and in the same dream, we installed waterworks. So <laughs> here we go. It was, it was quite entertaining. I love, I love the local papers. Okay, so you mentioned that uh, Seven Bend State Park was newly opened mm -hmm. in 2020. Mm -hmm. So how did that come about? So really it opened during 
the pandemic. It opened at the start of the year. Yeah. And oh, in then January. The, okay. Mm-hmm. And then the pandemic pandemic hit. Um, and so it's very much in development and yet is such a cool way to even access Mass Mountain Mountain. So it goes from Woodstock up onto the top of the mountain. Okay. And were was your organization involved in the creation or an opening of that park or? We were a part of the conversation, okay. certainly. We helped with plans. I think Friends of Seven Bend State Park, which is a part of Friends of the mm-hmm. North Fork of the Shenandoah River, but but sort of separate, okay. was were a whole bunch of volunteers who really motivated um, getting us to the point of being able to open the park. But it was a, a state decision, obviously. Okay. And did your organization exist before the creation of seven bands. Okay. Yes. Oh my goodness. I How should old is yours? <laughs> at the start. I'm so sorry. Um, we were established in 1988. So we've okay. been around for a while. Mm-hmm. All right. 1988. Okay. Um, let's see a couple of other questions in the retrospective hab problems this summer. What was learned from cause? Oh, from the algae bloom. Harmful <laughs> algae blooms. Mm-hmm. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, have is the abbreviation. So if you see that passed around. Thank you. Uh, What was learned about the causes beyond the drought? That's an excellent question. And I think something that's still being investigated. Certainly there are many, many parts to that question. Um, And I think I need to carefully answer, but some of it is nutrient the nutrients that are in the water from runoff of different locations. Some of it is heat stress. Some of it is still standing water. So there are many components, but there's definitely a human component. And that is that there were enough nutrients in the water in the first place to have even an algal map form. Mm -hmm. Algal mats in and of themselves are not harmful, but once they develop cyanobacteria, they are. So, yeah. Okay. Um, Can you comment on anything that's uh what's happening in Rockingham County with our with our watershed is there anything specific you know about going on down here say in Black's Run I am not as familiar Mm -hmm. with that location I know there are excellent places to look though Mm -hmm. again speaking with um the soil and water conservation district there and friends of Middle River which is uh really nearby um you can learn a lot more about what's actively happening as it relates to river and stream conservation there. Okay. Uh, Is there, and hopefully you can answer this, uh, are there new regulations regarding E. coli in the Shenandoah River? Is the river still safe to swim in? So I'm not aware of new regulations related to E. coli, but what I do know is that we should be always um, aware of when we have rain events and E. coli often E. coli numbers soar once we have a rain event, and then that allows runoff from um, often from some of the sources are agricultural areas Mm -hmm. um, that allows the E. coli to soar. And so we should be staying out of the river um, from one to three days after we have a big storm event. And keep an eye out on Friends of the Shenandoah River website because they're testing the river pretty frequently and can be telling you when it's safe or not safe to go. Okay. In. All right. Oh, that's really good to know. Um, could you comment on DDT still in the water supply? Um, because it washes out of garments made of cotton that's grown in countries that haven't banned it. Is that still, uh, or is that how big an issue is that for us? Um, that's an excellent question that I do not know the answer to. <laughs> I apologize. That's okay. Um, and I think those were all of our questions so far. So thank you so much. We'll wait uh, another minute, but thank you for, gosh, this is so much information. And I see, I know, <laughs> no, this, but that's good. This is what we wanted to talk about conservation and preservation in our Valley. And that includes our national resources. Um, and I'm excited. I did not realize that seven bends was so new. So that's, that was exciting to find out about. And it is. Yeah. It's been in the works for a while. So okay. it was an unofficial park, I guess, mm-hmm. of sorts. Um, and, and came from three different landowners, but it has recently opened to the public. Okay. Uh, let's see. I've got one other 
comment. NF. WF and the EPA just granted funds for two more systems to treat nitrates leaving springs and going to river in Rockingham County. Um, Ridge to reefs is the lead agency. So I think that was more of a, a comment. We put that in the chat too. So great. That's really good to know. <laughs> um, and I love that you also talked about things that we can do at home, like even things like the rain barrels. And what are some other ideas that we as citizen scientists in our own homes can do to help protect our watershed? I mean, I think that, I guess with the context of having just talked about harmful algal blooms, mm -hmm. keeping, keeping an eye on water, on your nearest water resources, what they're looking like and what what you're witnessing in terms of change in them. And then if there is something of concern, like um, really bad smelling water mm -hmm. or, um, you know, in the context of harmful algal blooms, sometimes algal mats being, uh, having your ear to the ground in terms of what our Virginia Department of Health agencies are saying because, and what the Shenandoah River Keeper is saying and what like different Potomac River Keeper um, folks are saying in those different areas is a good way to learn more and keep them informed of what you're seeing on the ground because there are only so many people employed to actually keep mm -hmm. an eye out. And so we rely on everyone's awareness and reporting to, to be able to pursue things further or even to think, to learn more about where there might be uh, a pollution problem. So encouraging us all to be citizen scientists and, and reporting what we see and not assume that somebody else is, is, is seeing it too. <laughs> right. And if you're really passionate about or, or are frequently witnessing a water body, getting involved in say benthic macroinvertebrate monitoring in a spot that where there's not that presence can um, be a really, really attainable way because Virginia Save Our Streams only monitors or has folks monitor twice a year can be a really um, low time investment way to be giving folks data that mm -hmm. all focuses um, towards having a, a broader understanding of what's going on throughout watersheds. So, uh, yeah. Go ahead. Um, oh, no, just finding little ways like that or getting involved in Virginia Save Our Streams Salt Watch campaign during the winter. You can have the or get these little test strips. Anyone can do it. Um, and to test salt levels throughout the winter when people are applying road salt um, mm. can be a really simple way for you to report what that what you're seeing. And then that can inform local policy or awareness campaigns associated with making sure we're not polluting the water. Um, our water that we rely on with salt. So there are many campaigns like that to keep it, keep an ear out for. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we had a comment from one of our uh, patrons um, reminder that, that you can contact the DEQ, the Valley office, if, and when you see river pollution, because they have people who will check that out for us. So, awesome. but does anybody else have any questions this evening or comments? This has been wonderful. Lots of engagement. Um, Okay, I'm, 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 I'm something, giving you your five seconds. Go ahead, Mariama. Oh, something I failed to do, which is a big oversight on my part, is to give folks my email if they want to reach out more. Mm -hmm. um, that I'm going to go to the first slide and just say that my email is my first name dot my last name at fnfsr.org. So we would love, um, if you have any more questions or think you might later, definitely shoot me an email. And if I don't know the answer, I can point you towards someone who, who does. All right. And we will, this was obviously recorded tonight and we will put this up on our uh, YouTube webpage, um, YouTube page channel, sorry, uh, hopefully by Monday. And we'll also include a lot of the links that were in the chat from Mariama, and we now have her email address in there. So we'll include that as well. Um, so everybody can get in touch with, if you're interested in all the opportunities or just want more information about what we can do to help conserve and protect parts of our natural resources here in the Valley. So again, thank you very much. And um, hopefully we'll see everybody again next week, same time, same, same channel. Um, but have a good evening. So thank you again, Mariama. Thank you.